So hello everybody. Um, thank you for taking the time to join the call today. It's lovely to see some friendly faces and some old comrades. Um, if you don't already know, I'm Jack. So I'm currently the chair of FirePro and I'm also the senior comms manager at Knott's Fire and Rescue Service, having recently moved from South Yorkshire. Um, I've been given very limited time to introduce this webinar because we have made a commitment that it's only 45 minutes and I'm keen to stick to that. Selfishly, I've also got a gig in Manchester tonight, so I don't really want to run over. Um, thankfully, I think the topic is relatively self-explanatory. Um, I don't think I'm alone in vividly remembering the heat we had last summer and the impact that had on us all. I know certainly in South Yorkshire, an old colleague of mine, a good friend of mine, Greg's just come on the call. He was with me when things were getting so bad in our office that the service essentially had no fire engines left send out to incidents because there were wildfires raging everywhere um, making matters worse. We couldn't even call for mutual aid from neighbours because everyone else was going through the same hell. So um, I think also I'm not alone in hoping that we don't experience that again, but we have to be realistic. Climate change is a, a real problem for us all. And I think it will be naive to think that so the problem of wildfires isn't going to go away anytime soon. So I think not all is lost, fortunately. I know from my own experience that good comms and campaign work can help reduce these incidents. Um, and ultimately, that's why I've organised this webinar today with the awesome folks from Alive and Can. So we've got a range of speakers. Um, I'm not going to go through them all because they have been listed on the adverts, I hope. But the aim of the game is ultimately to look at various tactics and tools that could help us all out, potentially with our summer campaigning this year. And I think there will be some discussion also around how we can work together and time to find messaging as well. So um, the formal stuff I've been asked to say, the session is being recorded, so a link will be sent out after for reference. Second, if you've got any questions, do put them in the chat throughout the webinar and we'll look to quant them after. And then my last role is to introduce our first speaker, who is the excellent Steph from Lancashire Fire. And she's going to talk to us about the major wildfire they dealt with a few years ago now in 2018 and the learning they took from that so i'll hand over to steph thank you right i'm gonna um try to highlight a few things from the winter hill wildfire which um it's the five-year anniversary of at the end of june and um, that have influenced how we communicate now and that might be useful for you to consider if you haven't already in terms of um the comms response to a large wildfire so um the incident began on Thursday the 28th of June 2018 during a prolonged heat wave uh, on Winter Hill, which is near Bolton, sort of between Lancashire and Manchester. Um, and two days in it became a major incident. The incident ground spanned 18 square kilometres, although we managed to contain the fire to around eight square kilometres. Uh, Winter Hill TV transmitter, which serves six million people in the northwest and right in the middle of that area. And at its height, we had uh, around 30 fire engines and 150 firefighters a day. Um, with support from fire and rescue services across the country, so I'm sure some of your colleagues um, came up or down or across to help us um, during this incident. Firefighting lasted six weeks before the stop message was sent on the 8th of August. So first thing, establish a road to early on for your comms team. In the first week of this incident, we, we being comms, had a presence at the incident ground and in the command support room for around 16, 17 hours a day. Um, so it was crucial to establish a road to early on. Uh, and what makes that possible is having really robust business continuity plans that you keep up to date and that work in a protracted scenario uh, like this. Secondly, the media activity will be demanding. Um, and what makes this unique is that an incident ground for a wildfire is often much more challenging than any other kind of incident because the size, the nature, the location, as much as the police tried to enforce a cordon around 18 square kilometres, it was impossible and uh, people could, were, could and were accessing the site. So um, photographers popping up left, right and centre. So having a forward media briefing point, just like any incident really, um, 
really crucial for us during Winter Hill. It was a gazebo, but we now have a media unit that can be mobilised to incidents exactly for this purpose, close enough to be useful to reporters, but uh, far enough away from operations. Then we were really structured in terms of dealing with the media. So every morning, 6 a.m., we um, gave really clear instructions to journalists, reminding them of the press point, setting out what we could offer that day, press conference times, trips we could facilitate onto the incident ground. And that structure worked really well for them and for us. So that's built into uh, emergency con plans now. I think it was really vital to facilitate taking them out onto the incident ground for interviews and imagery. Um, it just gave really effective warning and informing, essentially, particularly with regional TV, because this area, and this will be the same for your risk sites, I'm sure, isn't just populated by people from Lancashire. It attracts visitors from all the surrounding counties. So it was really important to get um, across to visitors who were coming into the county. Um, and one other thing was having a dedicated spokesperson who did do anything else for our cons was um, really crucial. We provided a really high level of media service that first week and it was fruitful, um, not just for the warning and forming, but then in the second week when I talked to reporters and said, look, we need to scale this back because we resources are diminished. They were absolutely great with that and we were able to pair that back. Internal communications need to be done on the ground and away from normal um, channels. So it was really important to communicate messages of support and thanks from the public to our staff, particularly into week three, four, five, um, to maintain staff morale. But your staff won't be um, sat in front of a computer or getting their emails if they're not at this incident, there are other incidents or they're off duty. So there was a lot of on the ground communication, we wrote to staff at their home addresses um, and there was a lot of thanking by leaders on the incident ground. We had a lot of donations from the public. I don't know if you've experienced this before, but in a, a situation like this, the public want to help uh, and comes inevitably um, deal with sorting out drop off point, communicating to uh, the public where they can take things but vitally then making sure your staff get those donations and are able to benefit from them again, keeping morale high, but making sure that link is, is there and that those things are used. So that's now built into emergency comms plans, but for other incidents where they might be protracted or there's a lot of public interest. Dedicate resource to stakeholder engagement. So it's quite likely you might have a high level of political interest if you're uh, if you have a fire authority like we do in Lancs, your fire authority members will definitely be interested. Local authority members, local MPs, um, they will want to be on the incident ground, they'll want to be kept to speed. So this is MPs Jake Berry and Lindsay Hoyle, Speaker of the House of Commons, who's also a local MP. Um, several times Jake Berry um, was at the incident ground with his own uh, press contingency as well. Uh, but he then became a really vocal uh, supporter in Parliament of proposing a ban on disposable barbecues. So uh, there are benefits to be had. There were also around 40 partners to engage with. So that's resource intensive. But again, it was really effective in terms of that united narrative and consistent key messages. And that some of those relationships that started at Winter Hill have become really well established now and um, to the extent that we're currently working with three local authorities on a joint public space protection order, um, which covers Winter Hill and surrounding areas where we have wildfire risk, which will hopefully be approved at those three councils this month and ban the use of disposable barbecues, fireworks, um, Chinese lanterns, basically naked flames. Um, so it's a really, it's a really well established and um, effective partnership. Um, it, you all know this, but I think a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, and what we found during Winter Hill was that the fire wasn't visible to most people, um, but the effects were widespread. And once you get sort of three, four weeks in, in the middle of summer, um, outdoor enthusiasts, walkers, cyclists. Um, we had an Ironman competition we had to cancel. They start getting frustrated. They want to use the space. 
Um, so imagery was essential to really portray the scale of the fire, uh, the difficult conditions firefighters were working in, and the fact that it was unsafe for the public to be up there. Um, we used lots of different imagery, a lot of drone imagery, um, which also included infrared images, which showed the peat burning underground. So on the surface, there might be nothing to see, but we were able to show why it was unsafe, and that was really helpful in keeping people away from the internet ground. And then finally, um, look for opportunities because amid the mayhem, there will be some. So the protracted nature of this incident gave us the opportunity to actually talk about some other things as well as wildfires. Uh, and one thing in particular was um, the on-call role. So we did quite a few interviews with on-call firefighters that really helped to elevate um, that as a um, topic, uh, obviously around recruitment and the role of uh, on-call firefighters in our service, which was really helpful. We also had um, fantastic coverage of female firefighters in imagery um, nationwide far better than anything we've ever achieved in a um, planned campaign. Um, and this image of our firefighters from Blackpool here was on the front page of the Daily Telegraph, um, which, was, which was a really good moment, to be honest. Other things, other opportunities were we found that people, particularly young people, really interested in the environmental impact. So imagery of um, burnt habitats, wildlife, etc., was really uh, impactive. And um, we're trying to do more work with that um, as a way to engage on this issue because that is what people hold on to, the, the, the environmental impact. Um, and being able to quantify some of that stuff, working with partners, we found was really helpful. Work with your tourist board. So here it's Marketing Lancashire. I don't know if it's the same set up around the country. Um, but they were really helpful to us and we still work with them now on wildfires in getting wildfire prevention messaging in visitor comms because like I say a lot of people frequenting the area weren't from Lancashire so that just helps reach um, that wider audience. This incident gave us early buy-in at our local resilience forum on the topic of wildfires um, which means that now it's a priority in the warning and informing group as up there with you know terrorist attacks and industrial accidents we spend as much time working on wildfires as we do those those other risks which is really helpful and then last but not least social media very challenging we didn't have any monitoring media or social monitoring tools at the time but did bring uh, great benefits so thousands of new social followers uh, one facebook post uh, reached 900,000 people organically and generated 160,000 engagements um, in July that year. The incident was ongoing throughout July. Twitter impressions reached nearly 4 million. Um, Tom Hardy thanked our crews on Instagram. So the public support was fantastic and we've worked really hard to keep those audiences engaged since then. Our wildfire uh, prevention uh, comms is all themed around look after Lancashire to tap into that, um, that public support. And people are still very supportive and big advocates of our prevention messages because of that. So I could go on, but I've got a time limit, but uh, we'll be here all day uh, if, if I was to talk, if I was to carry on. So um, if anyone would like to know more about this, this incident and what we've done since, they're more than welcome to contact me directly. Thank you. Thanks, Steph. That was um, that was brilliant. And I think speaking personally, the stuff around stakeholder engagement was particularly useful. Um, and that's one of the last things we think of when you're dealing with a sizable job, but it obviously had massive benefits after. And I also love the stuff around taking the opportunity to do on-call recruitment. So we don't have a limited time, so I want to skip straight on to introducing James Morton from Alive With Ideas as our next speaker. So James is very much a Fire Pro legend. And he is in my eyes one of the best in the business. So I'm sure he's going to give a um, a cracking presentation in the short space of time he's got. So I'll uh, in, I'll let him do his thing. Thanks, you're a charmer, Jack. Um, but I still need to remember to turn my microphone on, which is always useful. Um, uh, can everyone see what's on the screen? Everyone got that? OK, brilliant. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, thanks, Jack. And just, um, you know, 
following on really from Steph, you know, I guess as much as that was sort of specific to, um, you know, to, to Lancashire and to the Moors, I guess, you know, the point is that, uh, you know, that incident could have been happening or could happen, you know, in any of your locations. I can sort of see from the people on the call um, today that we've got people from north, you know, south, east, west and all over the place. And that could be a forest or a heathland or or anywhere, I suppose, anywhere, anywhere nearby. So there's that shared um, challenge, I guess, that, that we've all got around trying to educate people about the causes of wildfires and, and trying to reduce them. And I guess with the first heat wave uh, warning of the summer um, having just kicked in for this weekend, you know, it's it's perfect timing, really, for for us to be talking about it. So um, what we want to do sort of between myself and, and JP sort of talking on behalf of CAN is have a look at how, you know, this this shared challenge that we've got, maybe there could be a shared approach uh, to, to, to tackling it as well. And that being done in a way that is budget friendly and time and resource friendly as well, because we know those are two of the things or three of the things, of course, that that can be some of the hardest things to to address and hardest things to deal with. So having a look at maybe how there could be a joined up approach through FirePro uh, and amongst us all to, to tackle this. Uh, so just quickly to introduce ourselves, if you've not come across Alive with Ideas before, so we're a creative and uh, ideas agency that are sort of based down south, but sort of working with clients um, all over the place. And we sort of do bits and pieces all the way through from strategy planning and through to sort of all sorts of visual um, um, and content led. Um, yeah, content led campaigns. Um, and we love we love working with the fire sector. Um, you know, we work with quite a number of the services, um, you know, across the country, um, sponsors of the Fire Pro Conference for the last couple of years as well. So we've got a really, or hopefully we've got a really good understanding, um, you know, of what's important within fire services, both internally, uh, we've done internal uh, work and both externally as well in terms of external campaigns. But our work sort of spreads out into some of those other partners that you work with as well. So other blue light services, um, NHS trusts, local authorities, um, which hopefully sort of rounds out some of that knowledge uh, and experience as well. Thought I'd just insert a little bit of a Friday feel good factor uh, while we uh, while we get started on this. Um, I think this is a totally valid point, but I guess we're all biased in this room, really, aren't we? Um, and I think, you know, Dan's point is is sort of well founded, really. And I think the point really that he was kind of making off the back of this was that fire service communicators are probably some of the best at jumping from being, you know, working on a safety campaign to dealing with an emergency in a matter of seconds. And whilst other um, agencies may may struggle with that kind of, um, you know, jump from one thing to another, fire service communicators are just practiced at it and know how to do it and are brilliant at it. So I think it's well worth remembering this. And I think wildfires are probably a really good example of exactly that, you know, from switching from campaigning to, uh, you know, try and reduce wildfires and educate to actually dealing with them. Uh, and of course, what we want to try and do is try and sort of make some impact on that divide between those two things. Um, clearly, you don't see enough pictures of big fires, so I thought I'd just share another one. Um, but I guess sort of moving forward from where Steph was uh, a few years ago, you know, this was last year. Jack mentioned the ridiculous temperatures that, you know, were, were happening in in July of last year. Um, you know, record breaking temperatures. And of course, we all saw the impact of those wildfires. This is obviously that incident in London. Um, but of course, this is what was happening all over the country. And as the mirror very succinctly put it, you know, Britain, Britain was burning really in those in those really, really hot days. Um, but it's already begun, you know, it's already kicked in. We've had what, two, two, three weeks maybe of dry weather. Uh, we were all waiting for the sunshine to come along this year. And then within two or three weeks, wildfire season has already kicked in. Uh, a couple of examples there in Surrey uh, and Cambridgeshire as well. Um, so it's something that is already on our doorstep. And as I say, already we're, we're looking at a heat wave uh, warning for this um, for this weekend anyway. So so it's here. And so is there something we can do to try and address it? Um, so in terms of trying to look at kind of how a shared approach uh, might happen and, and kind of some of the things we can sort of look to try and address and, and, and bring together um, in terms of kind of looking at a, a behaviour change style approach. And, and Anne will, will build a bit more on this as well um, shortly. But yeah, some of the sort of things that, that we would look to try and do within within a behavioural change type approach 
it's trying to create a bit of a movement around the cause. So re a re a generating a really compelling cause that can help to drive a new mindset. Within that, prompting and encouraging individual action. Um, so, you know, calls to action that really, really look at personal responsibility and, you know, participating in doing the right thing. Uh, nudging behaviour. So identifying what those behaviours are, how they can be influenced and, and, and trying to give that some subtle but straightforward nudges. Um, and then the audiences really knowing who those audiences are, who we need to try and reach demographics, geography, all of those types of things as well. So basing our approach on this type of strategy. Um, and so just kind of doing a bit of where we are now uh, and then kind of where there may be possibilities and opportunities, you know, in the future. Um, you know, currently there is this shared challenge. You know, we're all trying to reduce the incidence of wildfire. We're all trying to, you know, reduce the impact of those both on the environment, on people as well all the messages you know whilst there may be some obviously some sort of slight localization some slight nuance very similar messages around you know barbecues cigarettes glass those type of things so at the moment we're all kind of operating in isolation uh, and pumping out those messages sort of between us in our in our local areas but is there an opportunity to kind of cross that line in the middle and say well actually is there some consistent branding and messaging that we can all share um, to make that more time friendly, to make that more resource efficient uh, and also sort of, you know, with a shared approach and shared creative that we can share and put out through social and potentially other channels as well. Um, and it's a, you know, it is a it is a practice that, that goes on, you know, and it's the localising of the message, a shared sort of national message, but the localisation of that message is something that's really effective and the NHS in particular, you know, they they do it really well. Um, this was an example of a campaign from last winter. Yes, yeah, so not the winter just gone. Sorry, the winter before that, uh, where there was a national, you know, stay well this winter campaign going on um, with the NHS. So on the left hand side, that's the kind of national materials. Um, but then we were um, helping um, localised NHS trust. So this was in north central London. We were helping to take that message from a from a national campaign, but localizing it and making it more pertinent, making it more resonant with people uh, at a local level. So you can see there on the right hand side references to Barnet and Islington. And then there was also sort of other areas of North Central London as well, sort of Camden, places like that, where the localizing of the message obviously made it more impactful for people. So can we take that type of model? Can we take that type of creative approach into something like this? Well, Potentially, um, just to be absolutely clear, this isn't a campaign visual that is ready to go off the shelf. This is something that we've just put together to show an example of how it could look. Um, but yeah, we could create, you know, there could be creation of content uh, and visuals where it becomes really easy to to make that localized, to use your own um, fire service branding, um, to insert, you know, a local reference to your county or your area. And this shared content, as I say, then becomes a lot more kind of easily adaptable, hopefully more sort of effective in terms of resources and budget and things like that. Um, so, yeah, that's very much an example visual, but uh, but hopefully just used to kind of show the possible create shared creative approach that we might be able to put to this. And that's our side of things. Uh, there's an email address there if you want to get in touch um, or obviously there's questions as well through the uh, through the rest of the webinar, but hopefully that's been useful. Thanks, James. I was, um, I was going to say the key takeaway for me initially was that fire service comms people are the best in the business. But what a slide to finish on. Sun's out, butts out. So um, next, I will hand over to another great speaker, which is Anne from West Yorkshire Fire. I know from being a, a previous neighbour that they have dealt with their fair share of wildfires and done some really good behaviour change campaign work in this area as well. So over to you, Anne. Thank you, Jack, and hello, everyone. Can I just get a thumbs up if you can see the slide? Great. Um, well, I've been working with West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service for the last eight months, helping them with communications and marketing. And I just want to say thanks to CAN and Alive with Ideas to bring for bringing us all here today so we can learn from each other and, and share best practice. As we've spoken about, we all know wildfires are becoming more frequent in the UK and while they might be perceived as small scale compared to sort of other infernos in the world, um, 
we need to take serious action. So I'm here to talk to you about how we are enriching our existing campaign at West Yorkshire this year and particularly applying behaviour change models and targeted metrics to build upon the work to date. You might have seen um, our campaign, which I think we started about four years ago, which is called Be More Aware. But I will note the plans that I'm going to take you through today. We've sort of just agreed um, them. So I'll take you sort of through the, the strategy and the ideas for implementation. We don't have live results on some of these tactics yet, but we're more than happy to share those with you as things progress. So a bit about the challenge for, for West Yorkshire, but it, it might probably not dissimilar to, to other areas, um, is the most impressive is, is the rate of increase. For us in West Yorkshire, we, we tackle mostly moorland and arable crop fires, which have overall roughly increased 30% in the last three years. And while there have been no fatalities, in addition to the obvious intensive resource deployment that Steph talked about, hundreds of hectares of flora and fauna have been destroyed and a significant amount of property. So it's similar to, again, what Steph mentioned, that once they get started, especially on the moorland, they're difficult to extinguish and continue for days, if not weeks. So as you can imagine, additionally, it's really hard for us to pinpoint the causation for these wildfires. And while we appreciate like there's, there's definitely more investment being put into this place and this, this side of the intelligence, we can make a confident assumption that part of this is through negligent behaviours such as disposable barbecue use in, in banned areas. As you can see pictured here, um, just taken on Marsden Moor last week. In terms of policy interventions, we do have um, PSPOs in place. With, with three local authorities. Um, however, these are just really difficult to enforce, sadly, given the footprint, we simply don't have enough resources to, to patrol these um, 24 seven. And realistically, we know we cannot rely on bans and restrictions alone from, from all accounts. The perception of risk and associated behavior change has by no means kept up with the rates that we're seeing the wildfires increase. But at West Yorkshire, we're sort of asking ourselves, what, what do we really know? And we realise now more than ever, we really need to understand the audiences in relation to this issue. And that's what we set out to do this year with our campaign. So I'll take you through some of the audiences. There's a lot of detail here because I've done a typical comms move and done a shift and lift from our, from our plan, but I'll just cut through the ones that we're focusing on. And I've tried to lay this out in sort of a think, feel, do, um, pattern which should sort of help you understand where we're trying to um, work through with these audiences. We of course have secondary audiences such as stakeholders and partner agencies which are really important and of course the, the general public is all within the scope of this. So part of this starts with sort of the older adolescents um, and young, adult, young adults potentially using disposable barbecues and we really want them to know that it's easy to check about the fire restrictions. Similarly, we're looking at parents and families, people who might be the sort of ringleaders that organise um, such outings or activities. And similarly, we want to, um, them to think about what restrictions. So just like they, they might check the weather when they're planning a picnic or a barbecue, we want them to think, okay, my next step is also to check what restrictions are in place. We've split out, I think, I think Steph might've mentioned this, that, um, we've split out Moreland and Parkland visitors because they're not necessarily local. And so our targeting techniques will be different. Um, and they're also kind of already there potentially. So we do for this audience want them to sort of know before they go um, and not bring barbecues with them. But we also want to use this audience sort of from the reporting side of things. So this year we're really trying to focus on getting this message out to report things to us. So one, if they see wildfires, but also if they see people doing the wrong thing, again, to help us with this patrolling side of things that again, we just can't possibly cover the whole area. So we can definitely use these audiences to help on that front. We're looking to work with school decision makers, of course, and helping enable them um, to engage with youth. Um, of course, we were doing the same thing, but I think we just want to sort of trigger that feeling of responsibility and how they can help us get the messages out there. We're also working with arable crop farmers, given this is one of the main areas um, of issue in, in West Yorkshire. We are trying to help prepare them and offer sort of a, a downloadable farm safety sort of guide to start with that engagement and a similar thing for residents who live within the urban interface. So 
making them aware that this risk is increasing and that we can help get them prepared. And finally, we are working with disposable barbecue retailers. We really want to remind them how they're morally connected to this issue, especially why the barbecues are still legal. Um, so we are going to be campaigning, typically campaigning at them with them and getting them to pledge to sign up to be a responsible retailer um, if should they still choose choose to sell them. So given the range of audiences that I've gone through, it's quite it's quite a lot, but this year we are seeking to sort of understand and work with more in a targeted way. So we have around eight objectives, I think, but this is just a sort of breakdown of what you can see here. We really want to improve access to this information around fire bans and fire restrictions, which we make some assumption people know, but we don't actually know if they do know that the, these things are in place. So we're going to measure that with how they search the information, which I, which I will get on to. And the same thing for sort of, you know, farmers, for example, how many are downloading these preparedness guys and how many local retailers can we get to pledge up to be a responsible um, retailer. A bit about our strategy, there's a lot of detail here, but as I mentioned, we are applying um, the trans theoretical behaviour change model here, which applies consideration on sub audiences based on their stage in the process. At the core of activity, for most of those audiences I went through, we want to remove the barriers to information on the fire restrictions and first and foremost, encourage them to get into this habit of checking before they make plans. And we want this to become habitual and to ultimately always know before they go. So we're building a searchable map on our landing page so users can simply pop in their location or intended visiting spot to see what restrictions are. And with this, they'll be given information and advice. We are focusing on sort of this enablement zone of the behaviour change model and weaving in tactics that ensure we have clear outtakes and that go on to inform both our communications and intervention. So as you can imagine, the majority of our campaign is digital, but of course there will be external relations, community engagement and classic signage in, in key locations which we've already got in place. And to help us amplify this, we're introducing content with 12 local micro influencers. So that's including young people, families, outdoor enthusiasts, and even farmers to help us with the storytelling and sort of normalize this new habit of checking and knowing before you go. So as you can imagine, typical comms, we're working at pace. Um, to set this all up, refreshing our landing page as it will become sort of a central hub for a lot of this. We're briefing our influencers and proving, approving their content, which is quite exciting to see their different spin on it. I think someone mentioned this like um, idea of caring for the environment, and that's definitely an angle we're taking. We're seeing coming through through with the influencers that you know they can connect with their audiences a bit further when they talk about the welfare of animals, for example. We're finishing up the, the map interface that will really bring a lot of this together and we're ensuring we have great resources and the right sort of resources for these farmers and, and the people who live nearby and also barbecue retailers. And I think at the start I mentioned, you know, how we just we really want to obviously campaign this year, but find out more. Um, so over and above our objectives, we've designed all of this activity so we can just capture more intel on our audiences, their motivations, barriers, opportunities, and that will really go on to inform future interventions and campaigns. And this includes sort of what we will get from those search behaviours with the map, but also what we what they don't search should tell us something in turn. And we, we hope to get some sentiment from the storytelling with the local influencers um, and from the initial engagement with farmers and, and retailers, which we've not done in a program way before. So overall, we're really excited about the, the potential results on this and what we will discover about these audiences and their behaviours by the end of the year. So that's me. Thank you for this quick run through. I hope you found it insightful and happy to answer any questions if you want to drop them uh, into the chat along with any feedback. That would be great. Thanks, Anne. I think um, I'm sure everyone agree that was that was brilliant. I got a massive, massive amount of love for all of it. I think the planning process you've gone through is obviously very complex and I assume it's been quite time consuming, but equally, but no doubt it will pay off. And I think that kind of level of effort when planning campaigns like this definitely, definitely does pay off. And even I'm not in Yorkshire anymore, but I am even excited to see the results. So Thank um, you. brilliant. I also like the uh, local influence stuff, which I think is really, really smart. So next and, and last but certainly not least, I'm going to introduce JP from Can Digital. Um, another absolute legend and a great, great guy. 
big supporter of Five Pro recently. Um, he's going to talk about some targeting and amplification strategies we can all potentially use that we may not have thought about. So I'll hand over to JP. Thank you, Jack, and then thank you for setting up this event to share. I think the event, you know, when we're in person together is brilliant, but having these dynamic opportunities for everyone to get together and share lots of wonderful ideas is, is hopefully really useful. Um, I'm John Paul from CAN. Um, we help the public sector amplify campaigns. So sometimes you have a brilliant strategy. Um, you then have wonderful creative and messaging from pool resources, but then it doesn't get delivered to the right people, right place, right time, sufficient proportion of the population. So all that good work um, is sort of hidden under a bushel. Um, and um, our job is to get it to the right places. And we're well aware that you know resources are constrained. Um, so I'm hoping to give you today um, a, a, a list of useful things for you. Um, so ideas for doing lots um, with Nout or not very little. Um, uh, some new app alerts technology, which could be really pertinent for wildfires and for uh, uh, and potentially for, for water safety and things like that. And then some suggestions as a, as the fire pro community of, of things that we could do together. Um, so starting with how to do um, lots of brilliant things with with not tons of budgets. Uh, first recommendation um, is to consider council channels. Councils are the biggest media owner uh, in their area. Um, they have websites um, where you can put ads targeting parents around school term dates pages. You can also potentially extend off those audiences. Often there are transport infrastructure sites again as well, which are um, a great way of identify people when they're making travel plans and dropping the message in at those points. They also have uh, business rates pages on their sites, which um, are a great way, again, of putting messages in front of uh, business owners if you want business owners to take a pledge. And they're also very influential in terms of local tourism, people planning on visiting the area. So it may not be in your usual audience or purview, but thinking of coming to you, getting them educated, getting them aware of how to keep themselves safe is, uh, is very important. Also, councils own um, large out of home estates. Their email newsletters go to thousands of people and have staggering open rates. So for doing things for free, think about council owned channels and having that good relationship with the council comms team. Um, and they're often happy to help. We're doing some little trials of this, which again, we'll share with the Fire Pro team. Um, but it's one of those things, you know, before you pay, you can use these very effective, um, effective channels for that. Uh, for young people, um, paid media on Snapchat is the way to go. TikTok's great, but the targeting's not good enough for individual fire services in terms of when you're doing paid media. Snapchat's brilliant, excellent interaction rates, um, really, really good value. So if you want to engage young people, spend um, a few hundred or a, a few thousand there, depending on your audience. And then also consider campaign partnerships. So um, you've got the summer events, um, targeting parents, uh, suggesting various activities, but you also have clean air campaigns. Um, there are a whole range of different um, existing campaigns that maybe you could partner with, offer a, um, uh, you know, a member of your team um, to, to appear as an influencer in certain campaigns. Um, that could also be a very neat way of, of doing, um, having a lot of impact, a lot of measurable impact, measurable impact with very, very little. Um, one piece of technology um, that's fairly new that we're hoping to deploy with this, you could see from Anne's strategy and, and well, or everyone's presentations, that geography was incredibly um, important. Um, We've now got a partnership with uh, Ordnance Survey where we can deliver messages through their app in very specific locations. Ordnance Survey is used by walkers a lot for route planning, so we could have walkers getting apps, uh, getting alerts triggered through their app as they arrive at certain high risk locations, um, alerting them on how to uh, protect themselves and also how to report instances of uh, suboptimal behaviour, should we say. We're hoping also to have a partnership with Met Office fairly soon where, you know, after three days of dry heat, um, we could start triggering those alerts when people have the Met Office app through to them as well. And um, we're also thinking about uh, people planning trips. So if you ask your council to get their parking app, it might be Ringo or pay by phone um, to set triggers when people arrive in car parks um, 
uh, near high risk locations. Um, maybe mention about barbecues, mention about reporting, mention about fines to deter bad behaviour at those points. Um, so uh, th this is a new piece of technology. Again, we'll be testing, we'll be sharing um, that with the fire product community to see how it works. The idea being always on right message, right time. Um, and then uh, in terms of you know, reducing um, cost or, or reducing cost per outcome or doing more with less, um, you may be familiar um, with comms files. It's um, a general public sector resource by comms 2.0 um, where lots of case studies and previous campaigns are shared. When you're planning a campaign, you go there um, and see what's around, see what other people have done. Um, we've built one for FirePro now, and we're going to start putting campaign data, resources and presentations, things like that in here. It's empty at the moment, um, but we, we're going to hopefully fill it with some um, useful things as we go. So check there in, in the future. Um, I think so there's the uh, things we can do together, share resources, um, trying new things together, um, new bits of technology like, for example, app alerts. Um, I think that's something where, you know, small amounts of investment um, shared between lots of people and sharing that data in real time um, can basically de-risk the trying of new things. It doesn't work. It's a small scale. Everyone knows we can move on. Um, and then I think another thing we can do together is share resources and learning in real time. So where we run campaigns um, and look at ads and interaction strategies, once that data is being collected, it makes sense um, to share these sorts of campaigns in a resource like this. So um, a few a few things to do to achieve a lot with very, very little resource um, and things we can do together to support each other, um, similarly to sharing creative, sharing data, sharing opportunities with each other. Um, I've whizzed through that deliberately. Um, I hope that was useful and we'll share all those resources afterwards. If you want to have a conversation about any of those things, um, you can pick a time that suits you there. Back to you, Jack. Finish one minute early. That is absolutely incredible and I did not think it would happen to be honest. Uh, thank you, JP. I think that is another stuff you do is really, really good. And particularly, I think we've had some challenge. I've certainly had some challenges over the last few years around things like targeting people via Facebook. You know, used to be quite a, a brilliant and easy way to get results. It doesn't seem to work like that anymore. So I think the work that Can Digital do is definitely a potential alternative for that. Um, we will obviously send the recording round, as I said earlier, and with that will be the details for anyone specifically in case you have any further questions very happy to try and squeeze in a question or two if anyone's got anything they want to ask or we will call it a day and then you can follow up afterwards via email i'm happy to stay on for a bit um if people if we want to work through those questions i think there's there aren't any hands going up um and there's no further questions in the chat so i'll not prolong it all i will say is thank you all for taking the time out of your days I know it is um, hard sometimes to find time, but I think it's really beneficial to spend time listening to great people talk. So as I say, we'll send out the recording and obviously details for people to follow up on things such as the offer from James and JP around how we can maybe all work together. Thank you, everyone.